Welcome to Living the New Life with Valentine Okeke. You shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. We've been talking about obtaining the best from God. And we said that for you to obtain the best from God, that there are certain facts that must be settled in your heart. And there are principles that you have to learn and apply to be able to obtain the best from God. We said that the first fact is that God knows the best. Number two is that he has the best. Number three is that he wants you to have the best. Those facts must be settled in your heart before you can start any meaningful journey with the Lord Almighty. You must come to terms with that fact that he knows the best because he is the creator of the heavens and the earth. He is the architect of this universe, so he knows everything. Everything lies naked before him, but it's nothing that is hidden before him. We must come to terms with that fact. Once you do, then you're ready to walk with him. He's the master, and that's why we call him Elohim, the God of all creation. Of course, not only that he knows the best, he has the best. That the cattle on a thousand hills, they belong to me. If I were hungry, I will not let you know. He has everything in his palms. But you see, for one to know the best and have the best, it's not enough. That's why we have the word in the dictionary, misers. Misers, they might know what you need. They might have it, but they are not willing to release it to you. But God wants you to have that best that he has. He delights in the prosperity of his children. We are told in Psalm 37, is it 37? Yeah, verse 27, or whichever way, it's in the Psalms. He delights, it gives him pleasure to see his children succeed. He said, never you forget the fact that I am the one that gives you the power to become wealthy. And we said that wealth is the reason why most of us are here today. We want to make it. How many of us will want to be poor? You left your village, you came to Abuja to be poor. You go to school because you want to be enlightened and from there be wealthy. But I want you this morning to realize that it is only God that gives that power. I know you'll be wondering, what of the occult? They are all counterfeit. You can never have a counterfeit without a real thing. The real thing must be there for you to counterfeit it. And I've said it and I'll continue to say it. Anything that has to do with God must have an element of growth. The counterfeit will make you rich overnight. But God made a promise, I'm going to take you from glory to glory to glory. There must be an element of growth. There must be gestation period when you're dealing with God. There must be a seed. That's why he said that seed time and harvest time will never cease. And because of that, some started teaching that give it and receive it. So 10,000 and get 1 million. It doesn't happen that way. There is always a gestation period. So seed time gestation period and harvest will never cease. 
there must be an element of growth. You plant a corn, it takes four days to germinate. You plant a bean seed, it takes nine days to germinate. The sperm you planted to the egg, conception takes place. It takes how many months? Nine months. And so on and so forth. So there must always be a gestation period. So when you are walking with God, expect him to take you from one level to the other. So once those facts are settled that he knows the best, that he has the best, and that he wants you to have the best, then you are ready to apply the principles that will enable you to obtain the best. And we said that the first one is that you must sincerely desire to please God. Without that sincere desire to please God, you will not be able to make it. Because Christ said, I have not come to do my will, but the will of the Father that sent me. And God himself said that I know the thoughts that I have towards you. They are thoughts of good and not of evil because I have an expected end for you. That means that God has a plan for each and every one of us. And that plan is what we call destiny. So until we key into the destiny... Then we'll be beating about the bush. So the only way we can please him is for us to line up with his program for our individual lives. Then we said that the second principle has to do with us desiring to get the best from God. Many people settle for the average, let my people go. God is not a God of averages. He said that I will guide you along the best pathway for your life. He said I will advise you and I will watch over you. So anything short of the best can God out of it. He created the best. And he longs for his children to have what? To have the best. Then we said number three that we need to focus on Jesus. We need to focus on him. That when we do, he helps us to take care of every distraction. Because he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one can get to the Father except through me. But the enemy of your soul will tell you that there are many ways. But I want to find out from you, in getting into this auditorium, how many doors did you have to pass through? But you have up to three windows here. So if somebody decides to come in through the window because it's an opening, what will be your reaction towards that person? You will know that something is wrong with him. Religion says that we can come to God anyhow that we please. And that is the problem we are having. But God in Christ came down to our level to bring us back to his height. But religion is saying, no, I can find God. And that explains why you have all the occults and secret societies that they are doing their own thing. They are all counterfeits. And the mere fact that they exist is a proof that indeed that there is a genuine God. If they can perform any miracle, if they can perform every, anything, just know that there is a genuine one. And my encouragement to you this morning is for you to try to identify with that genuine one. 
And you can find it in no other person except Jesus Christ. So we need to focus on him. Then we said that number four. That we must cultivate the habit of meditating on the word of God day and night. How often? Day and night. So that we can observe to do everything that is written in the word. And God made a promise that when you do that, you will make your way prosperous and have good success. If there is good success, that means that there is also what? Bad success. Having cultivated that habit of meditating on the word of God day and night, the next thing that we need to do is to make the Holy Spirit our best friend. Because Christ said, I will not leave you comfortless. I will send you a comforter, the spirit of truth. When he comes, he will reveal all things to you. And I said, like never before, we need the revelation knowledge. We need to know what is happening around us before it happens. We are living in a season... That if you don't hear accurately from God, you stand every chance of running into serious danger. So we need the help of the Holy Spirit, even in our prayer lives. We cannot afford to go this battle alone. The sad thing is that many Christians, they don't even realize that we are in a warfare. We lead our normal lives like any other person, forgetting that we are soldiers. And as soldiers of Jesus Christ, we ought to be alert. 24-7, we must be alert. Because the enemy of your soul is walking to and fro, looking for somebody to destroy. And the only person that can keep you alert is the Holy Spirit. That is why it is important for us to make him our best friend. Then we said that number six is that we must desire to hear the voice of God and obey him. We must desire to hear his voice and obey him. Of course, in hearing his voice, don't you ever forget that God and his word are one. So when you cultivate the habit of studying and meditating on this word of God, it will jump off the pages of this Bible and speak to you. If you've not accepted what is written here, I'm afraid you might not be able to hear any other thing from him. You must accept this, believe it, and let it settle every issue in your life. Then number seven, we must take heed what we hear and how we hear it. We must test the information coming into our ears. We cannot afford to open our ears to every junk. The problem that the children of God we are having in our time is that we have failed to realize that there are many voices, so many voices, seeking our attention. And if we are not careful, we open our ears to all those voices. The internet is there speaking. The TV is there speaking. The radio is there speaking. The drums of war is there speaking. Rumors, gossip, fake news, they are all there speaking. The social media, they are all there speaking. 
many voices. But we must learn to filter those things that we hear in accordance with the word of God in Philippians 4.8. We must filter the things that we hear. If they are not lovely, if they are not of a good report, we should not lend our ears to them. After we must have taken heed what we hear and how we hear it, because how we hear it, the attention we pay to it determines to what extent those things will drive into our heart. The next thing is for us to focus on eternity. Make heaven your goal. When you make heaven your goal, there are a lot of things temporary things that will not bother you. Heaven becomes your standard. For the young generation, it helps you to take care of peer pressure. It helps you to take care of fashion. Because like a friend said that Japan does not sleep. Every other month they come up with new ideas, new crazy things. So while you're trying to kill yourself about a particular fashion, a new one comes out. Meanwhile, you have messed up yourself trying to get hold of the iPad, um, iPhone 6. Before you say, Jack, they have 7, 8, 9, 10. Meanwhile, you're trying to kill yourself for iPad, uh, iPhone 6. They are already on number 10. So don't bother yourself with all those things. When you're young, you don't spend money. You save and invest money. Some of you are wearing your future in your hands. You go and buy a wristwatch worth 50, 100,000 naira. It must be nuts. That wristwatch is not adding any value to anything. It's just for you to have an idea what the time is all about. Am I right? And you're having a phone with you. And part of the function in your phone is time. So why should you waste precious 100,000 naira to go and buy a wristwatch? For some of you who want to belong... You go and buy a shoe handbag of 50,000 naira. You want to impress your mates that you're really swinging. You've decided to join the rat race. But the truth is that even if you win that race, you're still a rat. So why should you bother yourself joining the rat race? So when you're young, you don't spend money. What do you do to money? You invest it, save and invest it. You have to build up your resources so that you will be able to take advantage of opportunities that God will avail to you. Some of you are not happy with me. But that's why God sent me to you. Hallelujah. <laughs> Number nine. Allow God to choose for you. Allow him to do what? To choose for you. Do you know why? Because there is a path before every man. That seems right, but it leads to death. One translation says it leads to destruction. But death does not necessarily mean the termination of life. In its real sense, it means a negative form of life, of living. So, there is a path before every human being. That seems right. Seems means that 
all that guilt has is not good. It seems right, but it leads to what? To destruction. That's why you need to allow God to guide you. And he said that when you acknowledge him, when you recognize him, he said, I will direct your path. In all things, in, not in some things, in all things, it must be all for you to get his guidance. So allow God to choose for you. He said, this day have I set before you blessings and causes. Full stop. Was that what you have in your Bible? No. He said, this day have I set before you blessings and causes. Choose what? Choose blessing. He gave you the question. He gave you the answer. Why did he bother to go that far to let you know the correct thing to do? Because even as I speak, many of us are still missing it. Then the last principle, number 10, is that we must keep abiding. We must keep asking and we must keep advancing. How do you know when you abide in him? The things that you take to him in prayer is the acid test whether you are abiding in him or not. And God expects us to come to him with all things, not some things. Because those things that you don't take to God in prayer are the things that you believe that you can handle yourself. And too many times, that's the area where the enemy is waiting for us. We assume that we know. But God says, don't do that. Just like his servant David, always inquire from him. Even when the circumstances look alike, inquire. You will be surprised that he will give you a different instruction. Then, why must I keep asking him? Because when you go to Matthew chapter 6, verse 32, he said, I already know what you need. And I'm prepared to give it to you. So why? If he knows what I need, why should I go, go ahead and ask him? Very simple. As you keep asking, you keep the communication line open. He wants to hear your voice at all times because he wants to talk with you. We are told in the garden at the cool of the evening every day he comes down to discuss with Adam and Eve. God is restoring that relationship. He wants to hear the voice of his children at all times. That's why he said keep asking. But not like hiddens. Repeating the same thing. Okay? If you have taken anything to him in prayer that you have not received the answer, the way you keep asking is for you to thank him and say, I'm still waiting for that thing that I asked you, Father. I'm still trusting you for it. Not for you to kneel down and begin to cry all over again. Because when you do, that means he didn't hear you the first time. And once you apply those two, abiding and asking, advancing becomes inevitable. Because he said, I will move you from glory to glory. Nothing will stop it. It's automatic. Just like he commanded his blessings where there is unity and harmony. So if you want to experience the blessings of God, you must work hard at being at peace with your loved ones. That was why he said you must seek peace. Did he stop there? No, he said you must pursue it. Do you know why you need to pursue peace? If you don't pursue peace and catch up with him, you will miss out on the blessings because peace is the one carrying the blessing. 
So you need to be at peace with the people around you. Pursue peace. Because once you catch up with peace, you receive the blessing. Of course, you know that there is strength in unity. So this morning, having laid out the principles, we've already talked about the first two, a sincere desire to please God, and also desiring the best. So this morning, we are going to talk about the third principle that has to do with focusing on Jesus. When you focus on Jesus, two things will happen. The first one is that every form of distraction will be eliminated. The second thing that will happen is that you will be able to pick up speed. Because when you're running a race and you're looking back, you lose speed. But if you want to make and hit the mark on target, you must not look back. Then, of course, number three, when you focus on him, because he is the author and the finisher, he will perfect that thing that you are doing. So, for us to deal with this principle, there must be an attitudinal change. As it relates to the past, the present, and the future. We must learn to deal with the past. And in dealing with the past, we must come to God with an attitude. The attitude that I call nevertheless. Tell you never, nevertheless. It's an attitude. And that attitude simply means, irrespective of my past experiences, I will take you further at your word. Peter exhibited that attitude. You remember when Jesus Christ approached him and said, Peter, can I loan your boat? I need to minister to these people. That was in the morning. They had already toiled all night. And remember, they caught nothing. Now a young man walks up to Peter. I'm sure Peter was older than Jesus by far. He walks up to him and said, Sir, can I use your boat? Peter saw the crowd. I'm sure he must be wondering what, why they are all there at the seashore. He said, Please, loan me your boat. He said, Fine. Go ahead and have it. Though you're disturbing because we're trying to wash up to go and have a deserved rest. Not even deserved one, a frustrated one, because they toiled all night and caught nothing. And Jesus, standing there, started ministering to the people. When he finished, I'm sure Peter marveled at the things he had. Then Jesus Christ turned around to Peter and said, launch out into the deep. (laughs) 
If I looked at him, my father, my grandfather was a fisherman. My father is a professional fisherman, even if I'm learning. We've been fishing in this sea all these years. By experience, we know that you don't fish there during the day because the sea is very bright, very clean. If you throw a coin, you will see it go down, not like the muddy water that we have all over Africa. And the implication is that if you throw any net, the fish, they will see it and run away. That's why you fish in the night, not during the day there. So based on my experience, I know that you're just talking rubbish. But based on what I have heard from you a little while ago, it's like you have some superior argument. It's like you have something to offer because I've never heard anything like this before. But I will let you know how I feel about this thing that you have said. I will not just keep quiet and obey you, small boy. I must complain, oh, just like any one of us today. You tell them something, they will complain, they will grumble, they will murmur before they obey you. Don't worry about it. God is setting you free today. Amen? <laughs> Hallelujah. The young ones are smiling because I'm talking to them. They complain, they murmur, they grumble, yet they obey you. What's the point? So Peter said, Lord, we have toiled all night and we caught nothing. But nevertheless, at thy word, I will launch out into the deep. And he did. And what happened? You guys know the story. When that miracle took place, what was Peter's reaction? Did he go after the spoil? Some said no. Because he's been able to hit the bull's eye. This is the main guy. I don't need this fish. All I need is to get hooked onto this guy. If only I can get hooked onto him, every other thing will fall in line. Are you guys following it? That's focus. Peter did not allow the multitude of fish they caught to distract him. Take note of that. It wasn't that he did not need the money that would come out of it. Remember, he was a married man. The wife was waiting for him to come back with something. Of course, he knew that if Christ had not intervened, that he could have still gotten home empty-handed. Okay? He must have prepared the line to sell to the wife. But now something excellent and superior is happening. So as far as it's concerned, not going home with that fish is not a big deal. But I need to get to the bottom of this. I don't want anything to distract me. I want to get focused on Jesus. So that I can Take hold of everything that this young man has got to offer. So he left everything and followed him. He said, I've seen the one that has the word of eternal life. So we must come to him with that attitude of nevertheless. Irrespective of my past experiences with relationships and stuff like that, I'm prepared to try again. Irrespective of my failures, I am prepared to do what? To try again. Oh, 
some of us, we have this guilt that is by setting us. But we are told that Jesus Christ, he came to die for our sins. Did he die? So if he did, what did he die for? What did he die for? He died for those things. Is he going to die again? The answer is no. So that means that the past, the present, and the future sin had been taken care of. Some of you are saying, oh, he has started talking his own now. Should I abound in sin? The answer is no. But I want to lay a foundation because these are the things that distract us. These are things that we need to deal with. So let's see God's attitude towards our mistakes. Would I be able to settle that? So I will show you his attitude towards our mistakes. And I will show you what he expects us to do towards our mistakes. Let's quickly go to Isaiah chapter 1. Verse 18, he said, come now. I know some of you, your Bible is reading, come later. He said what? Come now. Let us argue this thing out, says the Lord. No matter how deep the stain of your sins, I can remove it. No matter how deep the stain of your sins, I can remove it. I can make you as clean as a freshly falling snow. Even if you are stained as red as crimson, I can make you as white as wool. Have you seen it? That's God's attitude. And that explains why Jesus Christ, hanging on that cross, was able to apply the law of forgiveness and love. He said, Father, forgive these people for they don't know what they are doing. He said it. That's God's attitude towards our mistakes. And how do we deal with these mistakes? Let's go to First John chapter 1. First John chapter 1. I'll read verse 8 and verse 9. It says that if we say we have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and refusing to accept the truth. Verse 9. But if we confess our sins to him, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from every wrong. Is that in your Bible? So what God expects us to do with our past mistakes, confess it to him. We are told that he's faithful and just to forgive us of all our mistakes. Why is it important for us to deal with with the things of the past. If we don't, we will not be able to move forward. Paul writing says in uh, Philippians chapter 3, verse 13, he said, this is one thing that I do. He said, I put my energy towards two things. The first one is to forget about the things of the past. Then the second, to press forward towards the future. Did you notice the sequence there? Did he press forward first before forgetting the things of the past? You know, it's like the horse and the cat. 
If you place the cart before the horse, are you going to have any movement? The answer is no. But somebody will say, after all, they are hooked together. Put the cart before the horse. But for you to have motion, the horse must be in front. Likewise, for you to be able to handle the issues of the day, which is the present, you must deal with the things of the past. And the only way you deal with the things of the past is to do what? Forget about them. Do you know why? They are all negative emotions and there is nothing you can do about it. You've made the mistake, you have made it. The only thing you can do, the best you can do, is to learn from your mistake and move ahead. Sitting down to regret and bemoan yourself will not change it. It's like crying over spilled milk. You're just wasting your time. So the first principle in focusing on Jesus is is that you must let go your past experiences if you want to deal with him. Just like Peter did. He said, nevertheless, irrespective of my experience, I'm just going to take you and your word, at your word. It's as simple as that. Left to me, I'm not going to listen to you, but I can see that you have something to offer. Is that okay? Let's see what the writer of Hebrew had to say concerning what we're talking about. Go to Hebrews quickly, chapter 12. I'll begin to read from verse 1. It says that, therefore... Since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down. Have you seen it? The things of the past, the sins, the mistakes of the past, has the ability of doing what? Slowing us down. Especially the sin. That so easily hinders our progress. Have you seen it? It hinders what? Your progress. Your mistakes of the past. When you dwell on them. It's going to hinder your progress. And let us run with endurance. The race that God has set before us. Who set this race before us? That race is your destiny. There is a destiny before every child of God. That God himself has said, not you, not the society, not your your mates. Nobody said that. That's why God said, don't go into competition with anybody. The race, I set it. I am going to be the invigilator. I'm going to be the examiner. I'm the one that will determine whether you fail or you pass. So why should you bother about what other people are saying? It's irrelevant. The race that you are running, I want you to come to terms with it. This race is set by God Almighty for you. So he is the one that is in a position to say, Oh, Frank, you have passed, or you have failed, or you have weak pass. You know they have weak pass. It's pass, but it's a weak one. Only God Almighty reserves the right to determine whether you are doing well or not. Because he said in his word, I know, not that I'm thinking, I know the thoughts that I have towards you. And he made it very clear that these thoughts are thoughts of good and not of evil. Because I have an expected end. There is a race There is a place that I'm taking you to. So no one has any right to come and judge you. And that's why we are told 
that I have given you the right to set aside every judgment. You know, we, we always quote that scripture in prayer, but this is where it applies. No weapon of the enemy fashions against me will prosper. And every tongue that rises against me in judgment, thou shalt set aside or condemn. This is where it applies. When you realize that the race that you're running is set by God and he is the one, he is the referee. You don't need to bother with any other person. Did you notice something these days? When you go for football matches, everybody is holding his whistle. But the players have been trained to recognize the genuine whistle of the referee. If not, as they are blowing that whistle of you, you might get confused. And that is exactly what is happening in our individual lives. There are a lot of referees. And what they do is that they create emotional stress for you. Because you allow them to become your examiner. Our success in life is not dependent on the whims and caprices of any human being. If only you realize it and key in into God's purpose for your life. No human being, God had not called any human being to be your examiner. Young ones, are you hearing me? I want to deliver you from peer pressure. Don't compete with anybody. Some of your mates might take off. You don't know what the, the covenant they got involved in. Tomorrow they are uh, driving a BMW uh, first class uh, ticket, business class ticket, and you are there trying to catch the night bus, and you think all this world has come against you. Relax. The race that you are running is not set by any human being. The most important thing is for you to key into God's purpose for your life. And the only way to do it is, number one, for you to focus on Jesus. Do you know why? He said, I am the way. I am the truth. So if you want to know the truth, you must find the way first. When you find the way, when you're in the right place, you will know the truth. And when you know the truth, the truth will lead you to life. But if you're on the wrong way, the wrong way will lead you to what? To lies. And lies will lead you to death. Because the opposite of life is death. That means negative principle of life. Everything will be upside down in your life. So it's important to key in on to Jesus. Who is the author and the finisher of our faith? In verse 2, it says there, We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus. Have you seen it? He said, let us run the race with endurance. The race that God has set before us. So that means that if you must pursue your destiny, we must keep our eyes on Jesus. On whom our faith depends from start to finish. He was willing to die a shameful death on the cross because of the joy he knew would be his afterwards. Now he is seated in the place of highest honor beside God's throne in heaven. So Christ is seated where? Besides God in heaven heaven. But that is not where I'm going. There was a joy that was set before him. Today, what is that joy that God has set before us? It's eternity. When you remember that all does not start here and end here. That there is eternity for us to pursue. That will make all the difference. It helps you to remain focused. And the person you focus on is who? Is Jesus. Because he laid a claim. He said, I am the way. 
He didn't say, I will show you the way. He said, I am the way. I am the truth and I am the life. And he said categorically that no one can get to the Father except through me. So when you focus on him, it helps you to eliminate jumping about from pillar to post. From one ministry to the other. All you need to do is to know that where you are, you're, you're hearing the right thing. The wind of doctrine will not blow you up and down. Because your focus is on who? On Jesus. So the first thing is our attitude towards the things of the past. Just like Paul said in Philippians 3.13, he said, I put all my efforts. Can we read that so that we can proceed? Philippians 3.13 He said, No, dear brothers and sisters, I am still not all I should be, but I am focusing all my energies on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. He's focusing all his energy. Did he say some of his energy? Everything that is in him, he's putting it into bear to forget about the things of the past so that he can reach out for the future. So that's the first part if you have to focus on Jesus. Your past experiences, your past mistakes, you must let go. And how do you do that? You confess them to him. That I've missed it in this, 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 this area. Forgive me. Once you ask him forgiveness, know that it's already settled. Because God said, I will not even remember. That's the meaning of plead your case. Once you mention it, God said, I will not do what? Remember. I've wiped it away. Because that was why I sent Christ in the first instance. Then, number two principle now in focusing on Jesus is now the present. Your lifestyle must change. You want to talk like Jesus, you want to behave like Jesus. You want to walk like Jesus. You want to see things the way he saw things. You want to listen to things the way he listened to things. And how do you do that? If you go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 11, we have an idea what Paul, writing by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, said should be our ambition in life. Once you have that ambition sorted out, then of necessity that will affect your lifestyle. If you go to First Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 11, he says this, This should be your ambition, to live a quiet life. Have you seen it? Minding your own business and walking with your hands, just as we commanded you before. Verse 12. As a result, people who are not Christians will respect the way you live. Have you seen it? And you will not need to depend on others to meet your financial needs. Three things there. Leading a quiet life. Minding your business. And working with your hands. 
is the principle of life. That should be our ambition. The opposite of living a quiet life is living a wild life. The opposite of not minding your business is what my mom used to call busybody. Gossip. You don't mind your business. You poke nose into everything, both the one that concerns you and the one that doesn't concern you. You want to talk about it. But when you focus on Jesus, you will be able to lead a quiet life. Because focusing on him helps you to emulate his lifestyle. The way he does things. The way he responds to issues. If you notice, Christ never reacted to an issue. He always took his time. And at the end of the day, the people marveled and said, we've never seen anyone behave like this. We've never seen anyone speak like this. Did you notice something about the religious people of his day? They never wanted him. They looked for every opportunity to take him out. At a point, they said he was even possessed by the devil. Some said he was mad. They accused him of meddling with... uh, Sinners, tax collectors. They said if this man had been a prophet, he ought to have known that this lady that is anointing his feet with oil, that she is a prostitute. They said all kinds of things. But he had a different attitude towards people. His perception was completely different. He sees things from a different perspective altogether. With the eyes of love, he looked at people. You remember when the woman was caught in adultery? He didn't see things the way the ordinary people saw it. They saw it from the point of view of the law. And when they dragged this woman to Jesus, they wanted to trap Jesus. Because they knew that Christ knew the law. And this was an acid test case for them to nail him. Because by the law of Moses, this woman was to be stoned to death. The woman. Nobody talked about the man that she committed the adultery with. Men are always on top. And he was busy... Writing something. Have you ever wondered what he was writing? He was writing down, John, you are the first person that is standing in the line accusing this woman. He wrote down his own sin, the one he just committed a few minutes ago. Peter, you just finished stealing your father's egg. This one, he was writing down all their sins. They were there looking at it. They saw it. When he finished, he looked up. Who among you has have not sinned? They've already seen their sins written down. And they all sneaked away quietly. And he turned around to the woman. He said, where are your accusers? The woman said, they've all gone. He said, I don't have anything against you. Go home and sin no more. That was Jesus. He looked beyond the woman's shortcoming and looked at her need. And what was the need of that woman at that material time? Can you tell me? Her life. Her life was at stake. And that was all Jesus could see. And because he saw that need, 
He was able to overlook the sin of adultery that the woman committed. That is what love is all about. He expects us to see things the way he sees things. If you don't see things with the eyes of love, there is no way you can help anybody. So to focus on Jesus simply means to learn how to love, how to see things from the, with the eyes of love, how to hear things with the ears of love. There are things you hear that people have said against you. With the ears of love, you will be able to overlook them. You don't take them to heart. I was handling a case last week. A dear friend of mine, you know, he's into business, brought the younger sister into the business. And somehow the younger sister is now under the influence of some people trying to manipulate the finances of the business. So like I said, he, he felt bad. Because when you bite the finger that fits you, the, definitely that finger will feel bad. Okay? So I, I gave him a very simple solution to the problem. Because blood is thicker than water. Do you know what it means? It simply means that there are some things that will take a while before you can solve it. When it's at the family level. That's the meaning of blood being thicker than water. There are things you might have to endure for a little longer. For an outsider, you might want to deal, it, deal with it in a week. But when it's a family member, you might just have to take your time. And when you do, there is every tendency that people will think that you're weak. You're not being weak. Blood is thicker than water. You're trying to allow things to settle. You're trying to allow water to find its level. So I simply told him, put her on payroll. Do her check for the next six months. Post data check and let her have it. But in the interim, close the shop so that this ill wind will stop blowing. When it's over, then we will cross the bridge. So focusing on Jesus helps you to cultivate a compassionate heart. You want to see things the way Jesus saw it when he was here on planet Earth. You want to hear things from that point of view. You want to reach out based on that. Because we are told that he had compassion on them and heal them all. That's an attitude. Kindness. I often tell people, is that eyes that sees the need. But seeing the need is not enough. Goodness. Is that hand that meets the need. That leg that walks the extra mile. To help. So you see that kindness and goodness are two sides of the same coin. Wherever you see kindness, you see goodness. But goodness cannot exist without kindness because you must see the need first. That's why it's an expression of love. When you see the need, you are now prepared to overlook the offenses. Too many times, because we don't look things with the eyes of love, we only focus on the offenses. 
And so long as you focus on the offenses, you will never be able to meet the need. It is the eyes of love that sees the needs. At the same time, overlooks the offense. So that's the principle that we need to work with. When we begin to emulate Jesus. Because you see, when you focus on him, it means that you are paying attention to his way of life. You want to ask yourself at all times, how would Jesus have reacted or responded to this particular situation? And once you cultivate that habit of asking that question, given every situation, what would have Jesus done if he were to be in my shoes? That's focusing on him. You want his lifestyle to guide and mold your own lifestyle. You want to be like him. Because you see, anything that you concentrate on absorbs you. It consumes you. Because it takes all your attention. And before you know it, you begin to talk like him, walk like him, and behave like him. Is that okay? So that's what it means to focus on Jesus. Dealing with the present. And that's why he said that the issues of the day is sufficient. You will notice something about Christ. Because all the time he knew the mind of God, nothing really perturbed him. He said, I never do anything of my own volition or accord or will. But whatsoever I see my father do is the same thing that I do. That should be our attitude. Is that okay? Then, what will be our attitude towards the future? Let's go to Colossians chapter 3. It says there, Let heaven fill your thoughts. Do not think only about things down here on earth. What should fill our thoughts? So if we must think about the future, let heaven fill our world. Our thoughts. Do not think only about things here on earth. Verse 3. For you died when Christ died. And your real life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ who is your real life is revealed to the whole world. You will share in all his glory. Do you know the importance of this principle? When you allow heaven to fill your thought, when it becomes your focus, the temporary things that bother you will no longer be relevant. They will become inconsequential because you have something else taking up your attention. You know that the challenges that you're going through now, the things that you can see, the things that you can feel, that they are all temporary. They don't have the ability of lasting permanently. So those are the principles. Dealing with the past. When you focus on Jesus, he helps you to deal with the past. He helps you to deal with the present. He helps you to deal with the future because you know that a day is coming when the trumpet will sound those that are dead in Christ will rise up and those that are still alive will be caught up with him in the sky and like the scripture says there will be no more crying or weeping who will join with him in an eternal glory Hallelujah. Are you looking forward to that day? 
The only way you can hold on to that is for you to focus on Jesus. Because when you do, it helps you to realize that he's gone to glory. And that he's now seated at the right hand of the Father, making intercession on your behalf. And he said, in my Father's house there are many mansions. He said, I go prepare a place for you. When your own is ready, I will come for you. That helps you to handle the issues and the challenges that you are facing. It helps you to take care of the blood pressure. When you know that what you are facing now is temporary, it, has, it doesn't have the ability of being permanent. God had ordained it to be so. And to assure you, he said, I have made a way of escape. God had not permitted anything to hold you down permanently. That is the good news. There is always a way of escape for a child of God. And the surest way of escape is for you to focus on Jesus. Give all your attention to him. And he will make everything beautiful at this time. Can we all stand? Thank you for listening to today's broadcast. You can join us in worship every Sunday by 9 a.m. for World Feast. Venue is at the 7 Option Park, Ladoke Akintola Boulevard, opposite Caribou Hotel, Gurki Abuja. God bless you.